So a while back, someone asked me, James, just explain to me in very simple terms, why is it that island nations are not adopting renewable energy more than they are? You've got abundant sunshine, wind, extremely high gas and energy prices. What's the deal? So I thought of a way to try to sum this up in very simple terms. It's much like the frog in the boiling pot. If you're familiar with this concept, if you take a frog and you put it in a pot and you slowly turn the temperature up, the frog does not discern that there's a real danger. There is no concept of needing to get out. There's no sense of urgency. And the frog will just simply sit there and boil to death. Well, today, if I walk out these doors and I walk down the street and I speak to someone and I say, hey, do you, do you support renewable energy? Do you support transitioning away from fossil fuels? Almost everyone universally will say, yes, absolutely. We definitely support that. But if you say, well, what are you doing about it? They'll say, well, nothing, not right now. But, uh, you know, I'll get to it at some point in the future. Well, it's the quintessential frog in the boiling pot. Caribbean islands themselves are viewed as paradise on Earth, and in many ways they are. Fantastic beaches, some of the best water in the world, fantastic climates. But there are other features for islands as well. Very low-lying, susceptible to flooding and storms. Also, island nations tend to have very high energy prices. Well, why is that? Well, it's because our economies are essentially based on 100% fossil fuels. Science tells us that this reliance on fossil fuels for our transportation and our energy is completely unsustainable, economically, socially, and environmentally. It also has a tremendous impact on our health. But let's examine for a moment, what are, we, what are we doing as a strategy now, and what can we be doing? Well, what we're doing now, essentially, we're digging fossil fuels up from the Earth, refining it in countries usually who are politically unstable. Oftentimes, their national security is different than ours and is a threat to our own national security. We take it, we put it in ships, we burn fossil fuels, shipping it around halfway around the world, and then we stuff it into our own diesel generators, we burn those fossil fuels, and the net result is extremely high electricity costs. But we get some other things with that high electricity cost as well. We get greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change, of which island nations are on the forefront. We also get damage to our health and our environment. Diesel particulates can increase the, cause, the, the rate of cancer by up to 70% through the use of our transportation and the way that we uh, use electricity. Climate change is really important for island nations. As I said, we are on the front lines of the mitigating effects and the possible negative effects of climate change. In Cayman, where I'm from, we talk about Hurricane Ivan a lot. It's that once in a lifetime, once in a generation storm caused billions of dollars in damage. But science tells us that in the coming years, our children and our grandchildren are going to be dealing with many Hurricane Ivans. It is going to become commonplace by comparison to today. Hurricane Ivan cost $3 billion worth of damage to the Cayman Islands. If we get one of those every year, every other year, every three years, every five years, we're going to be uninsurable as a country. That in itself is completely economically unsustainable. The population cannot reach into its pocket and pull out $3 billion every time a storm comes through. And worse, you won't need a Category 4 or 5. You'll need a Category 2 to do the same kind of damage because of rising sea level. This is something that we have to confront, and we have to confront it today. But luckily, there is good news. Island nations in general have many resources for carbon neutral, clean, renewable energy. Wind, hydro, geothermal, ocean thermal, waste to energy, but particularly sunshine. All island nations typically have abundant, infinite sunshine. And we can use this in many ways. Rooftops, building power plants, parking lots, schools, our home, you name it. Where we need energy, the technology exists today that we can be 100% renewable energy 
in the very near future, and we can certainly use lots more renewable energy than we're using today. One of the big changes is battery storage. So battery storage is what allows us to harness this clean renewable energy and to be able to use it 24-7. This is a very disruptive technology, but it's something that's going to set us free from fossil fuels. I like this quote. There's uh, many people who have quoted about what it is that we're doing with, with fossil fuels and renewable energy. You know, Elon Musk describes it as the dumbest experiment that human beings have ever done. Um, I liked Neil deGrasse Tyson's quote. Aliens might be surprised to learn that in the cosmos filled with limitless starlight, humans kill for energy sources buried in the sand. I think it sums up the idiocy of what we're doing quite well. Even worse, it goes beyond that. We're not only killing ourselves globally for this resource, we're actually destroying the planet in the process. But as I said, we do not have to. Four decades ago, solar panels cost 99% more than they do today. The technology exists today that we do not need any more new innovations to rid ourselves from fossil fuels, despite what the utilities will tell you despite what governments will say and politicians will tell you cannot be done. Now, to get to 100% renewable energy transition, it's simply about the economics now, not about new innovation. But new innovation will come, and it will speed up the progress of adoption. But today, we have all the technology we need that we can adopt renewable energy and get away from fossil fuels. Now, the key here is energy storage, just like solar for the last four decades, is also dropping precipitously in price and is allowing us to harness the energy and keep it and store it, giving us independence from fossil fuels and independence from utility grids. This is allowing us to crawl out of the pot. And some island nations are already on their way. They see the danger, they sense the urgency, and they're moving forward. Not all, but some are leading the way. Take Aruba, for example. Aruba, as of 2016, will be about 60% renewable energy powered, primarily through wind, solar, and energy storage. If you land at the airport in Aruba, you can tell exactly what their vision is for the energy future. They have three things that are very characteristic of all island nations who are adopting meaningful renewable energy. And it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with economics. It's political will, the leaders, bringing together the utilities, the regulators, the private sector, and the government, and moving forward. Consumer support. We as individuals, our businesses, our voters, supporting those leaders in the pursuit of renewable energy. And thirdly, utilizing resources available to us. There's a whole world out there of experts that are willing to help us for free. And we're not taking advantage of it. But Aruba is. So is Kauai. So is St. Lucia. So are many other island nations. But some are not. Take, for example, my own home country, Cayman Islands. We've been pursuing renewable energy for almost a decade. As of 2016, we have about 1% renewable energy to show for it. Aruba started after us, and by comparison, they will be at 60% this year. There'll be many to tell you, well, we can't do what Aruba has done. It's not true. The Cayman Islands is also the 25th, 25th worst carbon polluter on the planet, population of 50,000 people. Our most aggressive target for renewable energy over the next two decades is 13%. This is the lowest percentage of any country in the world that actually has a target, something myself and many others are embarrassed about. We have to get out of the pot, and we have to do more. We need the political alignment that countries like Aruba and like St. Lucia and like Kauai and like Hawaii have. If we don't, we risk nothing short of destroying our way of life.
This is a quote that I always keep close to my heart. We did not inherit the earth. We borrowed it from our children. We need to remember this because it's at the core. This is a moral issue. And as a moral issue, it's not about electrons and carbons. It's about right and wrong. And if we view it through the prism of right and wrong, we'll make it. Thank you.